Hey everyone, it's SM326, and today we're going to look at YOLAL chips. This is going to be a quick tutorial on how you can create YOLAL chips, how to use them, and I will show you three examples of some pretty cool things that I think would be a little useful on some machines. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll explain how these work, which are our modular YOLAL chip holders. So as you can see, I've got two of these YOLAL racks. They're 48 by 48 by 48, so they're just a 48 cube. And you can see I've got two different types of these three slot and then two slot YOLAL racks. So essentially what these are, you can plug in either a two or a three into your modular YOLAL racks and you can customize these. So I can take this and just kind of slap it on there. And then if I take another one of these racks, whether it's two or three, and put it in there, these will all be connected. So it's just like the mining crates, they're modular. If they're connected, they transmit power and data and they will work in conjunction. If you're going to make a modular YOLAL rack setup like I have here, you have to have one of these two slots because it comes with the power and data input, which you need for the entire array to work. So as you can see here, I've got the two and this box links up to this box, which has the three, which is where I'm storing my code. Right now, I don't need this top one, but I just wanted it to be here for a representation. I could easily take these two, drop them down, and it would still work. Your other option, other than your modular YOLAL boxes, is just a singular chip socket. This chip socket allows you to put one, only one, chip in it, and that chip can have up to, I believe, 20 lines, and it essentially serves as one of these little slots that you have in here except it's only on one large socket. So if you've got a really small chip that only requires one YOLAL chip, I would recommend just using the chip socket because you don't want to waste all of that extra space with the YOLAL rack. All right, so here we are in our test flight. I'm going to showcase to you each of the three things that I've coded, and then we're gonna go through each of them to see how I did it, and I'm gonna explain a little more on what you could do to improve on it or any other sort of ideas. So first, we're gonna take a look at the light. Now, obviously, you could just set up a button to turn on the light and turn off the light, but what if you want something like a, a blinking light, you know? Like on aircraft, they have navigation lights and they blink twice and go off for a little bit. That's what I've coded here. So if we go ahead and turn on our LOL, you can see that every couple of seconds, we get a double flash and then it turns off, then another double flash and it turns it back off. This is quite simple to create. So if we come on over here to our normal YOLAL chip socket, we're gonna go ahead and click on our code and edit the script. So there are a couple things you should note. Any variables or data fields, these guys that are over here, they need to start with a colon, not a semicolon, a colon. That lets the YOLAL chip differentiate local variables from data fields. The two main things you'll be using throughout your entire YOLAL chip coding career is going to be if then else statements and go to statements. The if statement is a conditional that checks a variable, whether that's local or a data field, and if it's equal to a certain value or not equal to or greater than, less than, all of those different operators, it will do something. In this case, I have my light burst, which is the name of my button right here light burst. If I press that button, this YOLAL chip, while it's always running, it's going to see in this conditional that light burst is now equal to one. And if it is equal to one, then we're going to go to line two. And this is what starts the flashing. So now I, you can see I have my lamp on. This is a data field from the actual lamp, lamp on right here. And so that's going to set it equal to one and then 0.2 seconds later, zero, 0.2 seconds later, one, so on and so forth. Then, if you just need to have a delay or any sort of space between your code, you just put actual physical spaces between the lines. I haven't written anything here, these are just empty, and I just went down to 14, and I added a go to one statement. What this statement does is it causes me to go back to line one and test for my variables. So, within this time, while I'm waiting, 
if I turn light burst off and that becomes zero as is default value, then this conditional will check it, see that it isn't one, so it'll skip the go to two, and it'll go through our else statement, which is go to 15. This will turn the lamp off and keep it off. And then after that, it'll go back to one to check it again. Two very important things to note is that one, with your if statements, it always needs to end with the word end. If you want to do nested if statements, like have two conditionals, you can do if something equals something, then do this. Else, if, and then another conditional. But like right here, I've just got an if statement and then the else. So if this value were three, it would go to go to 15. If it were four, same thing. The only time it's going to go to two is if it's one. So now that you know how to make time delays and also a flashing light, let's move on to the next thing. I've got this rail mover here, which the light is on. If I just go ahead and press this button, you can see our rail starts moving in increments. Now normally, if I just had a button and I set it to go on, then it would just keep going around. But in cases like you have a factory on a station, you don't want it to keep going. You want it to stop at each station for however much time and then keep going once whatever has been built has been built. So this time I decided to put the rail mover script into this YOLO rack. So let's go ahead and open that up and you can see right now it's not as long as the other one, but that's just because we don't need it to be. So once again, you can see my first line, it's an if then else because I just need to check one value and then go to two or go to five to complete my code. Just a note, remember, always end with end. We have that there. Else is optional, but I decided to put it in because I need that. And then all of my data fields start with a colon. So line two, we have our M rail, which if we come over to our rail mover, that would normally be our speed. So M rail is now our speed. So when we come in here and we set it to three, then the rail mover will move at a speed of three. Then it waits 0.4 seconds. And on this one, it changes it back to zero. So let's say that you need to take one whole second to bolt two parts together in a factory. Then you would want to put as many spaces as you would need, in this case it would be five spaces, in between this and then the next time that the rail mover is set to three. So next, on line eight, we have our go to one because we want to go back to the conditional now that our code has run. So we're gonna check the conditional again, and if it is one, we'll do the same thing. But then, if it isn't one, if it's two, three, four, zero, any of those numbers, we'll go to five. And this, once again, just like the light, it sets the speed to zero, or in the light's case, it sets the light to off, and then we go back to one to check again. So now that you know how to make a rail mover go and stop for however many seconds you need it to, and how to make a light flash in any way you want, now we're going to take a look at how to make a burst fire weapon. I'm not entirely sure if a burst fire weapon is going to be useful in the Starbase environment, because most of the time you're just gonna to wanna to spray and pray and hope that you hit your target. But it is really cool, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how it works. So in this case, instead of a toggle button, it's a hold down button. And you can see we have a burst of three. If I leave it on, it waits a couple seconds and it bursts in between. And then once we stop holding the button, it stops burst firing. All right, so once again, we have our YOLOL chip in this YOLOL box. We're gonna go ahead and open it. And as you can see, this one's even shorter because the code is actually pretty simple. So on the first line, as you can see, we have our conditional statement again. Now, I do wanna note, this is not required, but for most YOLOL code, you're probably going to need to start with an if statement, especially if you're checking to see if a button or lever has changed values. So on the first line, we have our AC burst, which is what I've called this button, AC burst. And if it's equal to one, we're going to go to line two. And if it isn't equal to one, then we're going to go to line six. So as you can see, every 0.2 seconds, we are going to fire the weapon by changing AC, which is in the barrel. That's usually called, I believe, fire weapon, something like that. 
and we're going to set that value to 1 to cause the weapon to fire. This is going to happen one, two, three times. And as you'll notice, I didn't separate the one from the zero. You can put your values like this if you want and change them all in one line, but it does it instantaneously. So if I were to put it on the next line, I might get one more shot out of the auto cannon because it waits 0.2 seconds to stop the fire command. So that's why they're on the same line. Then, of course, you have your go to one that takes it back to check. And then if it's false, we have our AC equals zero so that we make sure that the cannon does not fire at all. And then finally, another go to one to start the loop of checking again. All right. So just to recap and give a little more insight into just the basics of YOLO coding, it's just like any other language. You just got to learn the syntax. But really, this is all just logic. So first we have our variables. You can have two types. You can have a string, which is any sort of word, and they are encapsulated by two quotes. That's how you know it's a string. Then we also have a number. This is just zero through infinity. Uh, actually, I believe the maximum limit is the max integer limit, which is 2,470,000 something, but that is your limit for that. I don't think you're ever gonna run into it. And I would like to note, you can technically have a string that is a number, so if we just make a couple spaces here, type in var3, and we're gonna set that equal to, and then a number, let's do 200. This is not a number. This is technically a string. The reason why it's a string is because even though we have these characters or numbers, they are encapsulated in these quotes, which causes the compiler to think of them as a string. So they cannot be used as numbers. Also, one other thing, if we add a decimal point and any other sort of random numbers, that is now a decimal number. These are called strings. Then you have your integer, which is a number without a decimal. And then you have a float or double, depending on what language you come from, it changes. And that's it for our local variables. Remember, these are local. These are not data fields. So they are only shared within this YOLAL script. Now, if we come to line four, we have just our data field. Remember, these start with a colon, not a semicolon, and then they can be whatever you want to name them. And if you change this and something else in your YOLAL network has the same name, then that will change as well. Next, we've got if then statements. So for just a simple if then statement, you have if something, then do this, and then end. So here are the three keywords that you always need for that. No matter what if statement you need, you're always going to need these. Then on line seven, we've got if then else end. So in this case, if something, then do this, otherwise do that, and then end. And then lastly, we have if this, then do that, else if this thing is true, then do that and end. And lastly, we have our operators. These are all used in conjunction with our if then statements. So we can do if a number is greater than another number, then do something else. Or same thing for if this number is greater than or equal to that number, do this. Same thing for less than and less than or equal to. And of course, equals to. Now you'll notice I put the equals to in two equal signs. This is important because technically it isn't checking to see if the two are equal. It would be setting a data field. So if I have my data field that I typed up there, and if I do if data field is equal to one, then do this thing, and that will not work because that's setting in this statement data field to one. But if I just add another equals, it'll test if data field is equal to one, then do this thing. And that will be a valid if statement. That pretty much wraps it up for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you now know a little bit more about YOLOL and how it works in the game. Feel free to use the code that you saw in game. It's really easy to do, and you can probably make it a lot better if you just take a little time, learn the YOLOL, and then uh, start scripting. So yeah, once again, thanks for watching. Please leave in the comments down below which tutorial you would like to see next, and I'll try to get that uploaded and complete whenever possible.